Mary Lee Jones. I am the Professional Development Director at the Oakland County Bar Association. Uh, welcome again to this um, amazing presentation that we have today representing a person with mental illness. Um, the session today is being recorded. Um, you will have opportunities to use, um, to ask questions of the speakers. We ask that because it's being recorded, please raise your hand and we will bring a microphone to you so that um, you can be recorded for posterity and your question will be memorialized forever. <laughs> I am um, also in charge of, of housekeeping for now. If you are on um, the appointed council lists in Oakland County, and for that matter, in any county, I would ask that you complete the evaluation. Everybody should complete an evaluation. We really appreciate your feedback. And um, also, appointed council, you will need to return to me completed signed um, this sheet of paper. Uh, if you didn't receive it this morning when you came in, please let me know and I will bring you one. Um, we recommend that you take a picture of it so that if you are appointed counsel in any other jurisdiction, you can um, send this along to that jurisdiction so that they know that you have completed uh, CLE credits. Um, here in Oakland County. Um, other housekeeping issue, coffee's being replenished, eat the food from Ridley's, it's amazing, bathrooms are to the right. Um, and now I will um, turn it over to Mary Kucharik, who is a board member here at um, the Oakland Community Health Network. She is also um, a member of the Oakland County Bar Association and an attorney uh, at Bayer Howlett. Um, this presentation was kind of her baby, and I will let her explain how it came to be. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see so many faces. I have friends in the audience, uh, which is intimidating. I don't like that. Um, so many of you I know have been attorneys for many years. I would assume there are a lot of newbies in the audience as well. One thing I can guarantee after being in this profession for, I'm going to age myself terribly right now, 25, 26 years, is you will inevitably come in contact with a person who has mental health issues or substance abuse disorder, and they will need your help to navigate through either the criminal justice system, the um, judicial system, and more importantly, need your help in order to find resources so that they can improve their living. So the way that this kind of came about um, was, again, being in the criminal justice system. I do prosecutions for a number of municipalities. I've also been an Oakland County prosecutor. There are more people that we come in contact with in the criminal justice system because of their mental health issues. And I have found myself, as long as I've been doing this and as many persons as I've had contacts with, with those needs, I have often found myself with my hands up in the air saying, I have no idea what to do for this person. I have no idea how to get them the help they need. And I often felt that to push them through the system without steering them towards help and recovery or assistance, I was doing them a terrible disservice. So over the years, I've done my best to try to educate myself and found later that I was also educating defense attorneys, judges, court staff as well, but I still was at a loss. Um, which is part of why a couple years ago I was uh, given the gift to come aboard this board so that I could learn more to, again, help the people I come in contact with. So I'm happy to see all of you because obviously you've had the same frustrations I did. This came very clear um, sometime last year when I was working with an attorney who used to be a, a past bar president, and he had a client who was in the system only because of her mental health issues. 
I was able then to reach out to the experts here at the network, and they were able to help us get her services. The happiest result was within six months after seeing this young lady, she was a completely different person. She was healthy, she was strong, she was no longer part of the criminal justice system, she was reunited with her family and her support services, and she continues her mental health treatment today. To physically see the change in this one woman told me we cannot rest until every attorney in Oakland County, Wayne County, Macomb County knows what to do to help people. And that's how I think we're going to reduce people in the criminal justice system. So as you see, I'm pretty passionate about this because it matters. And when you help that one person, you're going to be ignited and passionate too. And you're going to get your colleagues to become better educated. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to the experts here. And when I say experts, the people who work at this network are unlike any other people I have ever met. I have never met a group of people who work more tire, tirelessly for good outcomes to the people they serve. I also have to throw one thing out, and I'm sure they're going to talk about it. One of the best things that you can do from this seminar is to learn a new language. We're learning a new language in that we don't call people consumers, patients, um, what some of the other words that we've, clients. For attorneys, we call them clients, and that's appropriate. But out in the treatment world, they are now called persons served or people. They're just people, like us. I know I struggle some days with certain things. I know you do too. Again, we're just people. They're people. Um, so we're learning a new language here at the network. Um, uh, Annette Downing, our new CEO, has brought this concept forward, and it's a powerful concept. So if you get nothing else out of today, Changing our lingo is key. Anyway, I am going to introduce um, our first speaker, um, Kathleen Kovach. I'm going to read from some notes. These people have so much to say about them that I couldn't possibly put it to memory. Um, Kathleen Kovach is the uh, Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operation Officer here at the Oakland Community Health Network. Uh, she's responsible for the overall planning and implementation of the service network and quality management audit teams. Her other duties include facilitating improving practices to the leadership team, organization uh, utilization management activities, providing direction to managers and the individual employees through coaching and problem solving, serving as a member of the human resources committees and developing an organization strategic team, time targeted and out -based, um, outcome based plan. She brings with her 30 years of experience in the, in the mental health human services field in both Michigan and Oklahoma. Prior to her arrival here at the network, she held the position of Vice President of Operations for Community Living Services. We have someone here today from Community Living Services. If you're not familiar with that, I hope someone's going to talk about Community Living Services. If not, I know there's some brochures out. That is a resource you will definitely want to know about. Uh, she received, Kathleen received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Social Work from Michigan State University and her Master's in Education um, in Educational Psychology from Wayne State University. She's also a licensed mo uh, Master Social Worker. She is passionate about ensuring that people who receive services through the network are treated with dignity and respect have quality services and supports, and are afforded opportunities to lead, lead meaningful lives. Again, that should be our goals as attorneys as well when we come into client, uh, contact with people who need our help to get them those services here at the network. So without further ado, Kathleen. Thank you, Mary. Um, Mary is correct. We are passionate about the work that we do. And I have to say, many, many days we work very tire tirelessly. Uh, she almost said tiredly, and I think that's also true. And after that long introduction, I'm a little exhausted. So 
Um, thank you for that, nonetheless, and thank you, Mary, for arranging this opportunity for us to talk to you today about the work that we do, the services that we offer, and probably more importantly, the touch points that we have so that we can work better together on behalf of the people whose lives we both touch. I knew this was going to happen. There, help me. Okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, I hope you know that we are the public mental health system uh, for Oakland County and we work on behalf of Oakland County citizens. Every year we support approximately 20,000 people, so that's a lot of lives to touch. And in any one month we probably provide active support to about 18,000 people. Many people are with us long term, but we have a number of people who come in and out of the system. They find themselves uh, having some issues or concerns in their lives, and so there is short-term uh, treatment and support. And as Mary had indicated, oftentimes you can see remarkable changes in a period of even six months. So it's extremely important for you to know who we are and the people that we support. Mary did touch upon it. I have in front of you a list of people we support, certainly adults and children with mental illness, kids we, we call it serious emotional disturbance. We support adults and children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We do have an inf infant mental health program. And certainly, last but not least, we have a wide-ranging network of prevention and treatment providers who support people with substance use disorder. And Mary talked to you about your work experience and coming in, in touch with people who have any one of these issues, concerns, challenges in their lives. And I guess I would say to you, I would uh, venture to guess that every one of you have had some experience in your own personal life, whether it's in your own family, with friends, someone in your neighborhood. And I know that has been my experience and the experience of many people that I work with. Um, over the course of my life, I've had continued contact with an aunt of mine who was at Pontiac State Hospital. I remember when I was 12 years old, my parents packed all of us in the car and we came to Pontiac to visit my aunt. I grew up on a farm in the thumb of Michigan, so it was quite a trip not only to the city back then, but I wasn't quite certain where we were going to visit my aunt. And we arrived at the institution, and it is an institution. And uh, I tell you what, it was quite an experience to this day. I can remember the sights, the sounds, and the smells. But probably what I remember more than anything is my father saying about his sister on the way home, I can't see that this is helping her a whole lot. So we've come a long way. It, well, it's what was there at the time, but we're an organization that's all about community-based services and supports, everyday lives. And I know we all have challenges, and we do need support to live the lives with our families, with our friends, neighbors, and in our own home communities. So that certainly is one example in my life. I have plenty of others, and uh, today is not the time for me to talk uh, about that. There will be others who will talk about the services and supports that we do offer. But I think it's important for you to know that everything we do is person-centered, and if it's a child, it's family-centered. And we have a set of values upon which we build our practices and our approaches in supporting and serving and treating people. And first and foremost, we believe in equality. Everyone comes into this world in an equal basis, and we also work to uh, retain personal choice uh, so that everybody can make their own decisions in their lives and live a rich, meaningful life uh, as we all want to do. Mary did talk about the languaging. Uh, we've always talked about people first language, as we call it. Sometimes we need to tack back to that, and so we have a 
an extensive initiative right now about that, but all the language that we use really does need to support dignity and respect for all people, for each and every person who we serve, and really, quite frankly, among us. We are the models not only inside the profession, but what kind of life do we want to live in our, ever, our own everyday life. We're guided by the goals, the needs, and the desires of people we serve. Again, this is all about what we call person-centered planning. Uh, there is an annual plan that's developed every year. We sit and listen with people and folks who support them. They may be family, friends, allies, and really establish goals in people's lives. And yes, people are challenged, but it is our responsibility to identify what those challenges are and provide the supports needed for people who come to us for services. We do promote and protect rights, and Nicole's gonna talk a little later about supported decision and making and guardianship, but we are all about civil rights and human rights, the dignity of people in retaining every single right that we are born into in this United States. And last but certainly not least, we also collaborate with a shared purpose. We have, uh, you'll f hear later this morning about some of the collaborative work that we do in our community. Uh, we also have a lot of work with both public and private organizations, both in our network and in our community in general. And I can say we have a lot of touch points with the justice system, with the county and the public health division, with churches, with housing organizations, uh, because it all it does take a village uh, to do this. It, that sounds like a bit of a cliche, but we know that we can't do this by ourselves. So again, I am so thrilled that you are here with us. Uh, we welcome you, and with that, we're going to have an introduction of Dr. Nicole Lawson. Curiosity, how many of you knew of the community network that we're discussing here today? How many of you knew of its existence here in Oakland County? So roughly five or six, um, which this is why this is so exciting and I'm, I'm hoping more of us attorneys are going to be listening to this. This is the first time these two entities are together, the Oakland County Bar Association and Community uh, Network. This is the first time we brought these two entities together and you can see why this is gonna be so great. So the next group of speakers are going to teach us how to actually get the services for your clients. Um, so that now you know that this entity exists, you now know where it's at, you know the phone numbers because you have all the brochures that you picked up from the table, but now you're gonna learn how to actually implement getting um, help for your clients in a very easy way. Um, the other part that is going to be your challenge is going to be to convince the judges and prosecutors that you work with to see that there's another way and there's an alternative to typical sentencings and typical jail sentences. And we can talk more about that later as well. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Nicole Larson, uh, who began her career here with the network uh, as a clinical analyst where she implemented evidence-based practices. Um, and maybe you can explain what that phrase means um, to families and uh, administered the serious emotional disturbances waiver pilot and participated in the uh, lead steering, lead steering committee to develop youth peer services. Um, she's advanced her career um, to the title now of clinical director. In this role, she was responsible for all clinical services provided to adults and youths with intellectual and developmental disabilities. If you could define that phrase as well. We, I know we hear it, but uh, those of us who are not in the field don't really know what that means. Um, and adults with mental illness and youth with serious emotional disturbances. Nicole is also responsible for implementation of integrated healthcare efforts as well as the development and implementation of all clinical policies, protocols, and procedures. So her name and phone number, it will be of huge value to you in the future. Um, she received her bachelor's degree in psychology from Rochester College, her master's degree in counseling from Siena Heights University, 
and her Doctor of Philosophy in Business Administration from North Central University. Mary, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity today to be able to talk with you about a lot of the clinical services and supports that we are able to provide for people. Um, I will invite you just to ask questions and stop me as we go along. Um, so just uh, raise a hand up and please do not hesitate. Tricia has the microphone um, so that we can make sure that all of your voices are heard as well today. I'm going to start with services for adults with mental illness. And so just to provide a brief definition of every population group of people that we support, um, again, adults um, can be eight individuals that are 18 all the way up through end of life. Um, and with a mental illness, we're talking about a serious and persistent mental illness. And so while we do use person first language and we do not like to tie people to a diagnosis, I'm sure that is probably what you're most familiar with. Um, so things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder. But the thing to really remember when you're talking about the public mental health system and as it pertains to individuals with mental illness is that it is a condition that is having a significant and long-term impact on their lives. And so it is very different from um, perhaps what you or I may have experienced as a short-term grief episode or a short-term uh, episode of depression in our lives. The people we support tend to have really major um, and longer-term impacts on their lives. So what do we do and how do we support people like the young lady that Mary had mentioned at the beginning? Well, for adults with mental illness um, and for every population we support, we have a whole continuum of services ranging from very intensive, um, long-term community-based supports um, all the way down to less intensive. And so for adults, we'll start with um, Assertive Community Treatment, or ACT. We love our acronyms. Um, so you, if I use one and you don't know what it says, please raise your hand. Um, I'm usually pretty good at saying them before I use them. But um, So ACT is an intensive and multidisciplinary team approach. And so an ACT team has a doctor, a nurse, master's level therapists, peers, and other case management social workers. And they work together as a team to meet all of a person's needs. So it's if you need medication, if you need education around chronic health care conditions that you're also experiencing, having a peer, who someone who has lived experience, who can talk to you about their journey into recovery with you, having the therapist to provide therapy. Um, they all work together to provide multiple appointments throughout a week. Um, they can help a person organizing their medications and putting those types of things together. <coughs> um, we also have more community-based or less intensive supports. Uh, one of them is called case management. And this involves really linking and coordinating, again, to make sure that someone has all of their needs met. Um, but Kathleen had mentioned person-centered planning. And so sometimes the people we support get a little overwhelmed by something like an ACT model. And so they're really saying, you know, I think I can do maybe some more of this independently, and I really don't want people coming and finding me or in my home multiple times a week. And we can offer things like case management. And that can be anything from, uh, once a week to once a month. Um, and it's more, if you're familiar with insurance, it's more of a cafeteria type plan. So ACT is a very bundled and intensive service. And community-based case management is much more, you can have therapy, you can have doctor supports, you can have peer supports. But all of those supports um, in their type amount and their scope are really developed through that person-centered planning process. And it is driven by the goals and the desires that that person we're supporting has for their own life and their own recovery. Um, peer services, I had mentioned them, but I would be remiss not to really, really punctuate peer services. Um, we take a great deal of pride uh, here in Oakland County and our support of peer services from youth peers to parent support partners who are parents of youth or even adults who have had intellectual and developmental disabilities or mental illness. And it's really 
um, helping individuals know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. A lot of times when people come to us, they are uh, desperate. And a lot of times hope is not necessarily at the forefront of their lives. And so having someone with that lived experience who can really walk you through everything that happened to them and let you know that there is hope and there is light at that end of the tunnel can make all the difference in the world. And there are things that I can say uh, as a clinician that don't mean anything because I haven't walked in their shoes. But someone with lived experience or a peer can say the same thing and make all the difference in the world. And so peers are a critical element to all of the supports and the services that we provide throughout the county. Um, Mary had mentioned evidence-based and evidence-informed practices. And so to define those, uh, evidence-based practices are very specific clinical treatment modalities that have a robust set of peer-reviewed research behind them that essentially trains a clinician to say, when you deliver services like this and in this way um, to people who are experiencing this particular set of issues or challenges, then the evidence supports that you will achieve this result. Um, and so you've heard of evidence-based medicine. I'm sure that there are specific antibiotics that your doctor will use to treat a strep throat infection versus an ear infection. So that's evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based practices in the therapy or the clinical service delivery world is a little bit different, but it is based on the same premise. Then we have, yes. No insurance? Do they need to live in Oakland County? Is there a certain number they call to st start the process to get assessed to see which type of treatment they need? Like, like who? If we're sitting there and we have a client that that we yep. know needs some help, do we need to screen them in some way to say before we refer them to you, or do you just? Is there a main number we give them? There is a main number, and Kathy Yunker is going to be covering that. Just uh, oh, okay. sorry, Christina will be covering that as soon as I'm done speaking. Um, so she'll give you all of the information and the main number. But back to um, kind of what Kathleen had said, um, I would encourage you if you have someone um, that you believe would be struggling to get that number and to call because even if they don't qualify, and we could do a whole presentation right on some of the nuances for the funding and, and all of those other things. Um, even if they didn't, we can refer to solid community resources. Um, so Christina will get a little bit more in depth. But that is a wonderful question. Uh, so evidence-informed practices are similar to evidence-based, only they're considered kind of a, a broader range or a broader lens. Um, and the trauma-informed therapy and the suicide or the self-harm prevention bullet points there really help to illustrate both evidence-based and evidence-informed. Um, so trauma-informed as an evidence-based practice, there is something that we are able to provide through our network called Seeking Safety. And that is a very specific evidence-based practice for individuals um, who have a significant complex traumatic background um, and may also have some co-occurring substance use disorder. And what that does is it teaches people about their triggers. So what happens in our lives that might trigger um, us feeling unsafe, that might trigger acting out behaviors, or maybe an old um, unhealthy pattern of behavior. And then it also delivers specific coping skills to help keep a person safe. So that's a very specific clinical intervention that we do uh, for adults throughout our network. We also have a trauma-informed uh, system. And what that means is that we know, based on an ACEs study that came out of Kaiser Permanente in California, that the average middle class adult um, can take a survey and 70% or upwards uh, will have experienced at least one significant traumatic event in their life. And then we also know that those traumatic events, the more often they happen, um, and the higher this score on this survey, the more impact it has on your overall health and well-being as you get into an adult. 
Now, if you talk about the individuals with mental illness or developmental disabilities that we support, we happen to know that the people we serve, it's 90% or upwards of the people we support have had at least one. The majority have um, a lot of complex trauma in their background. And so we have changed how we even approach people. Um, and what a trauma-informed lens talks about is what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. Um, and it really kind of changes the lens with how you look at, at someone's behavior. And I'll get into the a little bit too uh, when we talk about our supports to individuals with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So then we also have our suicide or self-harm prevention, um, a very specific clinical intervention we have for individuals um, who have self-injurious behaviors, um, i.e. you might be cutting um, headbanging, those types of things, is dialectical behavioral therapy, um, which has a whole long treatment modality of both individual and group related therapies to help an individual with those specific behaviors. But we also have a zero suicide system in which we approach suicide and we approach self-harm as even one person dying by suicide is too many. Um, and we also change our nomenclature and the way we approach that. And so there's a stereotype out there that says if someone really wants to die by suicide, they will. And we say that is not true. We say that suicide is 100% preventable. Uh, we also have changed uh, the way we speak about suicide in terms of we don't say someone completed suicide because that you complete a degree, you complete a grade level, um, and we don't say someone committed because we don't view it as a crime. So we say someone died by suicide. It's a form by death, no different than dying by cancer or dying by a heart attack. We also have services for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so to clarify um, our supports to this population a little bit and define that out for you, um, we have criteria, so kind of back to your question a little bit earlier, that talks about federal uh, functional limitations, so not the best of wording around there, um, but understanding how a person's intellectual slash cognitive or developmental disability affects their um, functioning on a day-to-day -day life. And so in order to uh, qualify for services, we look at a person's overall functioning and we see how impacted they are. Um, so again, just some examples um, of what we're most used to. So I'll go back to kind of some of the diagnoses is that we have, we support people who have had cerebral palsy, um, who have had other significant learning disabilities, um, Down syndrome, so just to, just to kind of relate that a little bit for you. Um, again, like Kathleen talked about, we do believe in community-based supports and services for all people. And so for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we offer supports coordination, which is again, the linking and the coordinating of all of a person's needs. So from housing to therapy to your social life. Um, are you feeling lonely? Do you have the friends that you want? How can we help you achieve that? Um, but we also offer self-determination, and that is really critical. Um, and CLS, the agency that Mary had mentioned earlier, um, is really stellar at offering self-determined services. And what those do is it puts a person in charge of all of their services. They are in charge of the budget for their services. They interview. They hire their staff. They determine what hours those staff are going to work. They make sure that those staff are paid, and they all stay within the parameters of the plan that they develop uh, with the people giving the supports. And so we are very much fans of self-determination. We believe in a person uh, driving their own services and supports. Another example would be respite, which is a short-term or intermittent break for caregivers. Um, it's also something that, you know, if we talked about youth services that we offer, it can be very challenging and overwhelming sometimes to be a caregiver for another person. Um, and so the respite services offers caregivers those, those breaks and some uh, me time, if you will. Um, we also offer community living supports 
the service, um, not to be confused with community living services, the organization. Um, and those assist people with community activities, grocery shopping, meal prepping, social connectedness, um, and they just kind of remind and prompt and help people. Um, so a very nuanced version is it's not, it's not personal care, it's not like a hand over hand assistance, but it's more of really having a mentor or a support there as you work through your day. And of course, we have evidence-based and evidence-informed practices um, for all the people that we support. And one example is gentle teaching. And gentle teaching really centers around the idea of our need to feel safe and connected. And it helps friends, family, loved ones, paid supports kind of understand where a person's coming from, even when a person might struggle to verbalize those feelings. And so Kathleen shared a personal story. I'll share a, a personal story that it, gentle teaching is really globalized for all of us. Um, I went through a phase where I felt like I was the only person loading and emptying and did the dishwasher and doing the dishes in my house. And I felt like I had done my very best to use my words and verbalize all of my frustration. And I didn't think it was getting through. And so I made the decision to act out and go on strike. And I stopped doing any of the dishes or touching the dishwasher. Um, and so in approaching from a gentle teaching, someone would have said, gee, Nicole, you appear to be pretty frustrated because you're not going near that dishwasher. Let's figure out what's going on. And so it's a way, again, to interpret behavior, um, looking at does the person feel unsafe or unsupported, and how can we change our approach to make sure that that person does have a safe, supported, and interconnected environment in which they can rely on. Yes? Were you successful in getting this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was. Uh, eventually successful and I will say if we do a uh, uh, presentation for you on our children's services I employed an evidence-based practice called parent management training that involves incentives they did not do it for free they had to have a, a carrot at the end of the stick so to speak yes thank you uh, we also offer ABA or applied behavioral analysis which you might be more familiar with um, it is an evidence-based practice very specific to supporting people with autism. Um, it uses discrete trials, which is a hand over hand teaching um, of different skill sets and skill building and really uses learning theory um, and the concept of reinforcement to teach those skills and then globalize them. Um, these services are offered both um, in the office and as well as home-based services and supports. Um, and then, of course, we have a, a wide range of uh, what you would consider typical talk therapy type of services and supports that we offer as well. So some additional supports and services that I wanted to touch on today, uh, care coordination. Um, so for a long, long time, um, mental health or behavioral health was considered um, helping people, quote unquote, from the neck up. And we have really done away with that idea um, over the course of the past five to ten years and understanding the significant correlation between our physical health and our behavioral health. Um, and so we offer care coordination services where as a behavioral health plan we work very closely with physical health plans to make sure that someone can maximize the benefits uh, offered by both healthcare systems without that person having to figure out how to navigate to very at times complex and confusing systems. We also have housing assistance. Uh, we partner very closely with Community Housing Network um, to provide linking and coordinating supports, um, finding housing, finding roommates. We know where there's open housing. They offer housing brokers and are a really wonderful partner and resource to people in Oakland County. We have specialized residential supports. Um, and so when people require a lot of personal care assistance, so the hand over hand, the helping with um, bathing, toileting, dressing, those types of things, um, a term you're all probably familiar with, NGRI. Um, we have individuals that go to 
uh, the forensic center sometimes if they are found not guilty by reason of insanity and when they are being discharged back into the community, we provide those supports and services and make sure that the contracts um, are in place and we are mandated um, to make sure that we have specialized residential supports in place for those individuals to ensure a good transition back into their community. Uh, we also have employment supports and so in addition to um, what you might think of as general support, linking and coordinating a person who says, I want, uh, I want a job or I want to work. We also partner with Michigan Rehab Services, who offers job education, job training. Um, but we have also developed a value-based purchasing model where we really drive and strive for the people we support who want to work, um, to work in fully integrated settings in the community and making at least minimum wage. Um, and that's part of our support and our value on community inclusion um, support and to advocate and really be a champion for people and people's civil rights. Um, and like Kathleen had mentioned, we really, really strive to ensure that all of the people that we support are treated with dignity. Um, this, in my mind, includes the dignity of risk. And I think a lot of times we come from a place of wanting to protect people. And it sometimes we go a step too far. And you can think of the overprotective parent. Um, every parent's a little scared, I think, when your kid's turning 18. Holy cow, they're going to tell me I'm 18 and I don't have to listen to you anymore and what am I going to do? Um, but just because your child has a mental illness or an intellectual or developmental disability does not mean that we have to strip them of every civil right that they were born with that the rest of us have and make those choices for them. Um, I, I know I did not make all of the best of decisions uh, from the age of 18 plus. I still don't make all of the best of decisions, um, but we are all entitled to that dignity and that risk. And so we really come from a, a place of supported decision making. Um, and so we really look at what can we do to help people understand uh, make good decisions, but also communicate the importance of the decisions that impact their lives and make sure that they have all the supports that they need without being denied all of the rights um, that, that they have. And so we look for family support, friend support. Do they have allies that can support them? Um, always leading again with person-centered planning and wanting that person to lead a very self-directed life. Um, we look for things like power of attorney, representative payees, instead of going for full guardianship of an individual. Um, what we advocate very strongly for is that instead of full guardianship or if guardianship is a last resort, um, that it is time limited and that it is for a very specific purpose. Um, just to allow the person to get whatever support they need until they are able to take back that decision-making authority and have the dignity and the risk um, that they so well deserve. Um, so that is it for me wrapping up those services. Did anybody have any questions before we turn it over for the introduction to Christina? Yes. Well, I just had one question about how you collaborate, or if you do collaborate with Oakland County Schools, catching the graduating seniors or um, the, the disability um, to your services. Um, we have great collaboration with Oakland County Schools. We have what's called a transition work group. Um, it's very specific in looking at youth um, from about 16 and a half up through their, their 18th birthday and making sure that we have good transitions. We also uh, actually contract with the Oakland Intermediate School District to provide specific wraparound services for really high risk youth throughout our community. Great question, yes. You mentioned helping um, with housing. Do you have people here that help with um, the application for public benefits or, or other financial resources? Yes, we do have, uh, we call them MARO workers, and that is an acronym that for the life of me I can't remember, so I'm going to apologize for that. Um, but they are federal benefit and assistance workers, and so we do um, actually cover the salary for three 
full-time benefits workers that are embedded in our core provider agencies around the county to make sure that people have assistance. Um, we also have the RISE Center, which I believe Christina will touch on, um, that is open to anyone over at the Resource and Crisis Center um, and can walk people through applying for assistance and benefits as well. Anybody else? Okay, thank you all very much. Going back to that young lady I was talking about at the beginning, part of what was so neat was once I learned about all the services that were just described, let me back up a little bit. This woman was brought to a, the district court, the 48th district court, and I see so many of you now, a couple more defense attorneys walked in that I work with all the time at the 48th. I think the district court setting is the ideal place to identify and be able to direct the persons that need our help and services at the district court setting. Most people don't wake up committing a felony. Most people grow into their felony situations. Would you guys agree with me? So in the district court setting is the perfect place to intervene. And not only can you intervene with that person, but their family. So in this particular situation, this young woman had assaulted her mother and sister multiple times. And what was happening was part of how the trigger would happen for her to assault would be, frankly, because the mom and sister were so exhausted and not knowing how to cope living with someone with such a severe mental illness. What we were able to do was not only get services for her, but the respite services for her mother and sister. We also got the mother and sister into counseling. So they then could learn how to cope and deal with the woman that they loved. And now as a result, the violent behavior has ceased and the family now is being supported as well. So that's my Pollyannish view, is that we not only take care of the people that are working with you as attorneys, but that you have an obligation to see that through for the whole family to prevent further criminal behavior, if that makes sense. Also, too, I want to clarify one thing. Dawn, it's Kaylin. Am I saying it correctly? Um, if, if, raise your hand for me. So Dawn works with Community Housing Network, and I said services earlier. And Sean, it, to the housing situation, she's a perfect person to talk to at break. She does help people um, obtain housing, permanent housing solutions with her organization. She's also an attorney. So you want to definitely speak to her at break. Um, and then, Paul, for the practical way of how do you get your people here, um, they, they are going to talk about that, I promise, because that's what I explained to them. We're dumb. We don't know how to get people here. We don't know what to do. We, d we know nothing. So know that when you come to t teach us today, teach us knowing that we have zero knowledge what we're doing. So they're going to give us the practical approach. This is how you actually help the people. Here are the services we can give you, and then they're going to tell us how to get our people here. Um, with that said, our next speaker, before I even introduce her, do you guys, you guys have all heard of Narcan, correct? and the lives Narcan is saving. That is the medication that is being given to people to reverse um, the effects of uh, um, overdose from specifically heroin. This is our champion in Oakland County who got that medication to all the law enforcement agencies. She's the person that we need to thank. So good for you. So this is Christina Nichols. Um, she's a social worker. Did I not bring glasses? No, I'm young. She's a social worker of 25, uh, two years of professional experience providing mental health and substance use disorder. That's a new one for me. I've always said substance abuse. Um, it is not substance abuse. It is substance use disorder um, and believed to be a disease like alcoholism, that they are disease processes. Um, so. If, if you struggle with substance use disorder like I do, it, the more you practice saying it, it will be the correct way to view it and see it and say it. Um, in any case, with uh, children, adolescents, and adults, um, she has presented at numerous professional conferences, um, as well as providing community presentations 
and training related to substance uh, misuse, as well as the Narcan initiative that I just spoke of. She works very closely with all of the law enforcement agencies here in Oakland County, and including the Sheriff Department, to um, educate about the opioid um, epidemic, as well as what we can do to start helping these people. Um, Christina is outpatient and residential treatment services uh, she's going to talk about and the different ways you can get your clients into treatment immediately. Um, she is also a clinical supervisor um, with behavioral health fields and currently uh, she is the administrator of substance use prevention and treatment services um, for Michigan's 10 prepaid outpatient health plans, and excuse me if I screw some of this up, I did not bring my glasses up. Um, and in this, uh, here at the network, as you see, she is the Director of Services um, for uh, the Oakland County uh, Health Network. So, Christina, by the way, before I forget, in case you forget, uh, Christina will be presenting, I think it's March 26th with the Oakland County Bar. Um, regarding the opioid crisis, along with many other very accomplished speakers. So put that in your books today. I attended it last year or the year before. Like I learned so much, I can't tell you. So make sure to put that in your book. Hi, everyone. Okay. So uh, one of the things I want to talk about, first and foremost, that is extremely important is how you access services. So. This screen is, is really your most important screen so you can assist people with what they need. One of the things is don't worry about whether people will qualify for services, what services they will qualify for. That is our responsibility as the public safety net and the public mental health system. And so if a person calls that number, we will walk them through it. If someone doesn't meet criteria for our services, we will refer them to serve it to where they do. If they have private insurance, um, if they don't have insurance, et cetera, then we will assist where they can go for lower cost services if they don't meet criteria for our services. And that goes for um, all of the populations that we serve. And so this is the number, it's one main number. Um, people can walk in also to our access center and receive walk-in services or they can make appointments. Um, our mental health and intellectual developmental disability or uh, services for children are largely done by phone screens. Uh, those with substance use disorders, they can receive a phone screen. They are largely seen face to face and that is because we tried to go to mostly phone screens and we found people were not following through with treatment. There's something about that initial connection that doesn't happen with other individuals or populations that we serve, but for some reason with people with substance use disorders. However, I will say again, we will do phone screens. Um, they are, uh, we don't want anything to be a barrier to accessing treatment. So if someone would prefer a phone screen, that is fine. What I think happens and why the face-to-face -face contact is so important is that there's a little law called 42 CFR Part B, and that is more stringent than HIPAA, which means to even care coordinate and contact our providers and set up appointments and make sure there's that connection, we have to have a signed release. When someone calls and wants a phone screen, we can set up and we can give them the appointment, but we can't call the provider, let the provider know who's coming, et cetera, so the provider can do some more outreach. That can't happen when you don't have a signed release. It's just, there's no way around it unless the law changes. So as you see, here are hours. That's our location. There are a plethora of services at the location. It's actually called the Resource and Crisis Center. And so there are numerous services there, um, including crisis services. So anyone in crisis can walk in. Kathy will talk a bit more about individuals who may need um, psychiatric hospitalization and the petition and certification process. Uh, but you can walk in for services if you feel you are in crisis. Anyone, you say, I see, if you feel, that means if you are in significant crisis, you could go into the crisis center. We are the public safety net, and this is open to all of the public. Now again, 
if you have a really excellent insurance policy and there is some substance or substance use or um, especially psychiatric hospitalization that you feel is needed, you may not need to go through that step. You actually don't need to go through the step of the crisis center. You would go through the step of what your insurance company is directing you to do. However, if you don't know how to navigate the system and you feel someone is in crisis, this is the place to go. So keep this number, um, call it. Our uh, referral specialists will assist, our, our screeners will assist, and get the person that you're working with where they need to go. So Nicole talked a bit about the RISE Center. Why I like the RISE Center is this is also a part of the public safety net. You don't need to meet any criteria to come into our RISE Center or to call our RISE Center. I see we didn't have the number, but the phone number will be on the brochures that are, that are here, so please take them. It's really assistance connecting to resources. It's open to the entire community. I could go in there today and ask for assistance. Um, any of you could. It also really helps people with maintaining recovery. If someone has questions, if they are new to recovery, they're not in treatment anymore, um, it's early intervention of those uh, at risk of relapse or um, really entering into their disease again. And also, I, we've had families bring family members there and say, can you just speak to my family member about treatment because maybe people are afraid of treatment and they're concerned. Um, there are services provided by a trained case manager, certified recovery coach, and they really connect people to resources. One of the main things they do, when in doubt, if you want to connect someone so they can apply for any type of benefits, is go into the RISE Center. That's about the number one thing they do is connect people and help them apply for insurance benefits, for food benefits, et cetera, housing benefits. Um, community housing services comes in once a, a week or every two weeks and um, w works in the RISE Center to connect people to housing. This is also in our resource and crisis center. So it's right where the access center is as well. It's right where our crisis center is. And I highly suggest um, you referring people there because we can help and we can help with applying for benefits uh, first and foremost. But really whatever a person needs, they're going to do what they need to do to connect them. Sober support unit. We really created the sober support unit because for, I've been in this position for a little over a decade. And one thing that I never agreed with was the, the state rules that um, you are in compliance if you place someone in treatment within 14 days. And just working um, clinically with individuals that have a substance use disorder, I know that the quicker you can connect someone to treatment, the more likely they'll begin to enter into recovery. And so when a person is seeking treatment, you want to get them into treatment as fast as possible. So this was a dream of mine that um, finally came to fruition. And um, it's also in the Resource and Crisis Center. And it is the services are delivered by Common Ground. And this is a unit that you can go in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And they will. Um, do an assessment, they will um, take you onto the unit, and within less than 24 hours, you will be connected to substance use treatment. Now, when it says you must be medically or psychiatrically stable, I want to say something about that. Remember, this is at the Resource and Crisis Center. If someone is in a psychiatric crisis of, of any way, shape, or form, there's another unit where they can be assessed and um, linked with services. And so don't not refer someone there who's using substances and has a mental illness because first of all, having a mental illness is not a reason why they would not go on this unit. But if they were also in psychiatric crisis, that is the place to go and they will place them on the correct, um, in the correct area. So again, it really assists people with being connected to a higher level of care. Our providers in general have been wonderful because many of them increased hours and access hours. So on weekends, you come in within less than 24 hours, there's one of our providers there to pick a person up. Um, also, sometimes people are looking at getting into medication-assisted treatment and they just didn't know where to go or what to do and they come there and then our screeners will connect them there. 
What's nice about medication-assisted treatment now is that we have the ability to assist with transportation services. So before that was a barrier to linking anyone with it, but now we are able to do that even if they don't have um, transportation to go. So this sober support unit has helped a lot. It's really only been open since um, October and we've serviced like about 1,500 people at this point. So, um, and it's not just for opiate use, it's for any substance use disorder. As a matter of fact, um, the number one uh, disorder that people have come in have been alcohol use disorders, followed by individuals with opiate use disorders. So again, um, it doesn't matter what the substance is. If someone needs to be connected to treatment immediately, send them to the sober support unit. Yes. I don't want to, um, I won't talk too, too much about common ground because I know Kathy is going to discuss it, but we talked about being the public safety net and in every region um, you have to have the availability of crisis services and so common ground is our 24 hour, seven day a week crisis center so people in crisis can go there. Um, I'm not going to define a crisis because everyone's crisis is different, but largely it's also a place if you don't have uh, private insurance or a connection to um, psychiatric services, hospital services, that you can be assessed and determined whether or not you need to be hospitalized. Again, um, hospitalization is really the last resort. And so connecting people to services in the community are far more important. Um, but you can go there. Err on the side of caution. If you are concerned about someone and you feel that they are in some form of crisis, it is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is housed on the um, government campus. So uh, the same campus as the jail, the health division, veteran services, it's right there, which is why you see um, 1200 North Telegraph. It's right on the county government campus. Uh, so that is where people can um, access services. There's a bus stop right there. It's one of the reasons why it was selected. So you can get there by public transportation. And um, again, I think Kathy will go a little more in depth about uh, psychiatric hospitalization and, and the petition insert process. Any other questions, Mary? Okay. Okay. So we have a wide range of services for people with substance use disorders, and the reality is you don't need to know exactly what the person that you're representing needs. That is what we are here and the licensed clinicians are here to determine. One of the good things about outpatient services is that we have many all throughout Oakland County, and a person can go straight to the outpatient uh, office and seek services. They there will conduct an assessment, determine if that's the appropriate level of care, and submit the authorization for services. The other thing that's really great about um, our numerous outpatient providers is m most of them take numerous insurances as well. So regardless of whether they need public funding or not, our providers really um, have a, are on panel with numerous, numerous insurances. The other thing is that we, we work with individuals with both with mild, moderate, and severe substance use disorders. And so you'll see uh, mentioned treatment readiness groups or early intervention. And so maybe you are representing someone who received their um, first drunk driving offense. And uh, they are looking at needing some type of services because the judge is going to order them. Well, the person may not think that they need the services. Early intervention is a great program for people to go in because it's largely educational in nature. It um, really looks at people's stage of change. Where are they in the potential recovery process? Do they understand that their substance use is problematic and causing issues in their life and um, or not? And this 
this early intervention program really kind of teaches about that. Oftentimes people, we get requests then for people to be in um, more services within outpatient after because a person may say, you know, I think I do need some additional support with that. And um, it's time limited, it's really educational in nature, and it also allows both the clinicians and the person to determine if they need further services. Then, you know, there's the, um, what people oftentimes think a, lot, think a lot about therapy, which is individual services, group services, family services. Um, Nicole talked about case management. Very, very important here. Oftentimes, and I'm sure you may know this, with people with substance use disorders that you're representing have lost a lot in their lives um, because of their disease. And they really need to build that back up. Coupled with that are court fees, and et cetera, et cetera, that make it very difficult for a person to move forward. Add on the fact that if you have um, a criminal record, it's really hard to sometimes uh, obtain employment. And so case managers are very good at assisting with all of that and linking individuals to the services they need. Um, and then comes the peer recovery coach services. And uh, Nicole briefly touched on that, but individuals that are in long-term recovery, uh, I often hear the been there, done that. So um, what we've seen is a huge increase in follow through with services um, and entering into recovery since peer recovery coach services were a recognized intervention. It has been absolutely unbelievable. I have been in this field, as Mary said, for 22 years. We didn't have anything like that when I was first uh, starting as a clinician. And I've seen the difference that they can make, and it is amazing. We have recovery coaches at both our residential treatment centers and all of our outpatient centers because what we want to do is make sure that there's that connection. Um, an individual simply going through residential services, the statistics are not good on entering into long-term recovery. That's just the facts. Uh, the continuum of care is very important. You can liken residential services, I'll talk about that a bit more um, in a minute, but you can liken it to, you know, you go into the hospital when you're at your most acute state. And once you're stabilized, then you're discharged from the hospital and you're to follow up with your primary care physician, et cetera. That is largely what residential is. So it's, it's generally shorter term and then you go through the continuum of care. And so peer recovery coaches, what they do is they follow the person from residential treatment until they make their first appointment in outpatient uh, because that's a very crucial time period. Oftentimes, uh, residential providers and outpatient providers try to schedule it that it's the very next day after their discharge, sometimes same day. But again, that is a person's choice. And so ultimately, they will schedule the appointment according to what a person wants to do. Patient assisted treatment. This is very, very, very important intervention. It is showing far better outcomes um, than residential treatment. That does not mean that residential treatment and withdrawal management that I'm about to talk about are not good interventions. What we're seeing with the opioid epidemic is that we're seeing a higher rate of individuals entering into recovery when there is some form of medication-assisted treatment involved. That is just what science and statistics are telling us. And um, I will tell you also, this can be very a very controversial, it shouldn't be, but it is, uh, method of treatment. It's very evidence-based. But myself, 22 years ago, felt very different about medication-assisted treatment today. And that's because I allowed science and data to teach me and move forward and not stay. We don't treat cancer the same way 20 years ago that we treat it today. And that's what we have to look at. We look at the science behind it, how it's uh, been very helpful, and we look at the statistics. So medication-assisted treatment has been particularly difficult within the court system. However, we are seeing an amazing transformation occurring. Um, we are a very uh, rich county with treatment courts, 
And I work, um, I sit on the Board of Community Corrections and we work very closely. I know Community Corrections is a big supporter of medication assisted treatment. And I also know that um, judges are working to educate themselves and more and more judges are in heavy support of medication assisted treatment. Also, if you receive federal funding for your treatment court, you cannot deny a person medication assisted treatment. It must be a viable option. And so treatment courts, and they're also now, the state court administrator's office with the treatment court funding are actually giving funding specific for medication assisted treatment. We work very closely with the treatment courts. They don't get a lot of money. So one of the things that we say, if people meet criteria for our services, let's work with them, we will screen them, we'll provide the treatment or fund the treatment, um, and then you can save the small dollars you have for things like the um, numerous amounts of drug tests that are ordered for a person to take, because those are quite expensive. Again, one of the additional things that makes it difficult for an individual who's, who's lost everything. So use the money for things that people truly need. If they meet our criteria, we would treat them anyway. Um, we sit on the treatment courts. Um, we sit on at least two right now. We've sat on more before to um, help provide subject matter expertise, link people. So the access supervisor um, in access that we have, Megan Phillips, she sits on them and um, provides a lot of information. And I, I think this is an excellent route to go. Um, what we have found is that individuals that are involved in a treatment court have higher rates of success. Sometimes people think it might be easier to, uh, I'll stay 30 days in jail. Then you see the continuum of people coming back to jail. Um, it's, a, it's a revolving cycle. So treatment courts, really that, that extra support and assistance and treatment have seen a lot of success and I highly recommend it for individuals with substance use disorders that you find are continually um, involved in the court system. The other thing that's, that's been great about medication assisted treatment is that we um, worked with our county jail and we have a medication assisted treatment program in our jail. Um, it was about the first in the state to be as comprehensive as we have because it allows for all three of the medications that you see on the screen to be um, distributed in the jail setting. There is therapy services, peer recovery coach services, care coordination services, the physician is there, um, and it's been very, very successful. We saw about a 5% rate of people following through with treatment when given a referral when incarcerated. We are at about a 50% rate of people now following through with treatment when we started the treatment in the jail. So we're seeing some some really good results with that. Um, and judges are starting to uh, be very on board with it. Um, there's individuals that are in the in alternatives to incarceration program through community corrections that they're uh, shifting some out of residential treatment services and saying they can begin the MAT program while in the jail. So there's a lot of um, services that can be provided to individuals in jail as well. Well, there we go. Did I skip? Nope. Oh my. Okay. Recovery housing. This is another thing that I think could be helpful for uh, defense attorneys. Oftentimes you may have individuals that don't have a place to go. And we have recovery housing that we um, provide for individuals that we serve. And so oftentimes people don't have a safe environment to live in. There may be individuals still using a number of substances that live in the home and they need to go in order to really support the recovery. And we do, we provide this service. It's a safe, sober community. There's house managers, it's highly monitored and um, it really uh, helps an individual while they're in the treatment process if they don't have a place to live that is conducive to their recovery.
all management, I talked a bit about that. That is really to mitigate the symptoms of withdrawal. And oftentimes with substance use disorders, such as alcohol use disorders or opiate use disorders, one of the reasons why people really struggle with entering into recovery is because of how sick they are. And that is just simply the truth. It causes significant, significant uh, signs and symptoms of illness, such as vomiting, diarrhea, uh, sh you know, shakes, fever, etc. And a lot of times when people come to us for services, they'll say, I, I, I so want to stop using this substance, but I'm too sick. I, I, I keep taking it just to even function. And so withdrawal management, while it's not a therapeutic intervention, it is a medical intervention, and it helps control the active withdrawal symptoms and avert life-threatening medical crises, especially when you're withdrawing from like alcohol or the prescription drug Xanax. It can be very dangerous, and so it does need to be monitored by a physician, and, and uh, the withdrawal symptoms need to be monitored. It's not really safe to just stop using substances like that. Um, that's not so much with the opiates, but you feel like you're going to die. And so they, um, physicians use medications, their specific protocols, and it mitigates the symptoms for three to five days, and then a person can enter into actual treatment feeling much better and able to um, actually respond to the treatment. I talked a bit about residential treatment. Residential treatment's for your, often your most acute level of uh, need, and it is, Residential nature, 24 hours monitoring, a lot of in-depth therapeutic services and support services to get a person ready for discharge and moving on in the continuum of services. Again, all of these services are voluntary. So we may make recommendations. That may not be what the person uh, wants, and we will honor what a person wants in terms of the services that we can offer. Um, we can't force anyone, we can't force anyone to stay in, in uh, treatment that is um, a person's decision and we support that wholeheartedly. We will engage in what's called motivational interviewing, which is an evidence-based intervention to help a person look at what the benefits would be to staying in treatment, but we can't ultimately uh, force a person into treatment. And that is one of the things I would suggest as well, um, if you could encourage that could assist a person um, that needs services or that may be court ordered for services. When we receive a person that's court ordered for services, sometimes they'll come in and say, the judge said I have to have group three days and two individual sessions a week. Well, by our sheer funding sources, that's not what we can honor. Um, we have to be, it be based on what's called medical or clinical necessity. So truly what a person needs, no less than that, um, but truly what a person needs. And that's how their treatment is going to be developed in conjunction with the person. Uh, Nicole talked about person-centered planning or individualized treatment. That's going to be based on what a person feels they need, the recommendations of a licensed clinician, and in determining that. If a judge orders um, specific types of therapeutic intervention and a person can't afford it, and we're uh, supporting services that are based on clinical or medical necessity, that may leave a person really struggling to honor what the judge wants. And so um, many judges are recognizing that. We don't see those type of orders near as much as we did 20 years ago. Um, and so they'll just maybe order treatment, but not a specific amount scope and duration of that treatment. Uh, that's what I would advocate for, though, for a person, is that um, if they're going to order treatment, order treatment that a licensed professional recommend, recommends is necessary for them. Yes? Is there a, uh, like kind of so, yep, that, so that is um, what we were, what I talked about earlier with the sober support unit. Um, if People will oftentimes, in fact, we have this more now. Yes, we have immediate availability for treatment. That's based on when a person wants to go. So when I said I had a dream of being able to connect people immediately, um, that is possible, but it really depends on when a person wants to go. So more often we have people say, you know, 
I have some affairs to get in order. I have some things to do. I have to work this out. So can I go Thursday? You can go today, but if you choose to go Thursday, that's, that's fine as well. Um, we, we can't, again, say. We can encourage, the, uh, but we all have things going on in our lives. I, I couldn't just drop everything and go somewhere right now. I'd, I'd need a day or so to get my affairs in order um, if I was just going to completely leave my family and be gone. Um, so I understand that. Sometimes people used to view it, which is very stigmatizing, as, well, they're just not ready for treatment. They don't, they don't really want it. That's not necessarily the case. It's that they, like all of us, have a lot going on in their lives, sometimes even a great deal more with less resources. And so that is um, what a person may say. They don't, um, oftentimes it's very scary as well. Um, you're making a significant life change. Even though you, you know, intellectually know it's for, um, to help you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not still scary because you've been living one way for a long, long period of time. So yes, we do have immediate availability for services. It just depends on if that's what a person wants. Any other? Um, you, we talked a lot about, you talked a lot about um, person-centered planning. How does that interplay with working with a guardian, whether it's a family member guardian or um, a public type of guardian? Well, back in my experience when I worked um, in mental health, that person is heavily involved in that process, or should be, because if you're taking on the responsibility of being someone's guardian, then you should be heavily involved in the process as well. And um, you should, uh, you have to approve essentially all of the services. Is there anything else, Nicole, that you wanna say? So um, we can't make decisions with a person that has a guardian without the guardian being involved. That's the guardian, um, the guardian has to approve of it which is why we want to shift towards people, you know, as soon as possible, being able to make their own decisions for themselves when capable of doing so. One thing that if you have women that are pregnant um, or with small children, it's important to know that there are women's specialty services in the state. You have to be designated by the state of Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services as a women's specialty program, and they service the whole family. So if you're a pregnant woman, the, the provider must ensure that they have access to prenatal care, that if there are existing children, that there's child care, they, that there's transportation to treatment, that there's uh, therapeutic services for children. If you are a man or a primary caregiver, so you are the sole responsibility of the children in your family, it's a little bit of an old term, but women's specialty services also apply uh, to men and primary caregivers as well. One thing that's really helpful to uh, pregnant women or women with small children or caregivers is that you can bring your children to treatment with you. Oftentimes, um, people say, what, what am I going to do? Um, I can't be away from my children that long. I'm really struggling. Well, they can go with them. And that provides a great deal of ease for um, many parents. And again, in residential treatment, um, they've been known to take high-risk pregnancies uh, because they'll just work really closely either with the, the current treating physician or they will connect them. Um, one of the most exciting things we see is when a mom brings her very healthy uh, infant in after treatment and the baby was born healthy, happy, mom is doing well, uh, she's in recovery, it's very, very exciting. So they are there. Again, all you have to know is to call our access number, we will take it from there and link people um, as needed. I talked a bit about case management services, I think Nicole covered it, you name it, they help connect with it. Talked about peer recovery coaches and how important they are. Um, 
it's just done such a world of good. We've seen that uh, we, had a, we had a temporary change in the jail between recovery coaches. And even just in that short period that our recovery coach, uh, we were in between recovery coaches, we saw a difference. And it's just, I cannot explain how crucial it is uh, for people to have the opportunity to work with someone with lived experience. Okay, any further questions for me? Thank you very much. Before we take a break, hang on. Is, is all this information, while it is as easy as calling the access number, why it's continuing to be so important for you to know and understand all of the programming is then your advocacy skills then need to have this knowledge. It's been our experience that it's hard for judges to change how they sentence people. It's your job then to be able to convince them to take a risk and do something different. And the only way you can convince them is by having the knowledge yourself. So to be able to say to a judge, instead of putting this person on your typical probation, instead know that they are going to be receiving these services. You will be able to articulate them, define them, expound on them, to convince the judge that this is a better way for them to sentence the person than what they were going to do with their typical probation department. So as you are hearing all of these different uh, messages, be thinking how you're going to convince, I'm not gonna say judges' names, but many of you in this room know them, how are you going to convince them to take a risk? And again, the more you know the program, the more you know about it, the more you can talk about its success, the more likely you are going to be to be that person's advocate and get the judge to change her mind. Her mind. I mean, his mind. Okay, thank you. Just, to, to that end, I want to give just a, a, a brief um, recent thing that happened. So the judge um, actually could have sentenced the person to prison because of um, what they had done. And um, the, the person was saying, well, or the um, attorney was saying, you know, I really think treatment, this is all based on the person's substance use disorder. They can get into treatment right now. And the judge said, if you leave this courtroom and go straight to the sober support unit to enter into treatment immediately, then I will suspend the sentence. If I'm saying that correctly, I'm certainly not a lawyer, so I apologize. And so we received a phone call um, from the judge that said, I need to know that this person showed up. We obtained the necessary, re necessary releases. The person was, in fact, on the sober support unit and went to treatment the next day. And that's because the, uh, the judge was educated on the sober support unit, the fact that they could go and talked a lot about uh, the fact that this is the way the person's going to get better is by, the, by receiving treatment. And it, it worked very well. So it can happen uh, with your support and education to the judges. We are going to take a 10 minute break and we will reconvene at uh, 1040.
Volunteer work is carrying things. He says, I can't do it. I mean, that's Hello. <laughs> if everybody could take their seats.
I will introduce Mary again to uh, start the proceedings, but I did want to clarify something on the attendance sheets, the sheets that you have all been given and must uh, return to me. Um, put three, if you've been here from the beginning to the end, we are counting the break. So um, this seminar is worth three credits in total. If you came in late, um, I will leave that up to you to subtract the um, time that you were not here. Otherwise, everything should add up to three. And with that math done, Mary? The next person who's going to give a brief presentation to us is a gal by the name of Deborah Monroe. Um, she is a certified peer support specialist and recovery coach. She has lived experience with mental illness in the criminal justice system. She now provides peer support certification training in correctional facilities and throughout Oakland County. So this takes a great deal of courage to come in front of you and speak, um, but we'll share some thoughts as to how best to serve your clients. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm not sure how to, there we go. Um, so just to give you, you know, so I do have that lived experience of, of dealing with the criminal justice system. Um, as a person uh, that was struggling with a mental health disorder and substance abuse disorder, um, and just to give you a little uh, a background of where I came from and how uh, hard it was to maneuver through that or navigate through that system. Um, and, you know, had I been able to, had someone reached out early on, maybe I had, wouldn't have been in that system for as long as I was. You know, so growing up, I come from a very dysfunctional family, didn't have a lot of uh, support, and found myself early on getting involved in the criminal justice system uh, through running away and things like that. Uh, was trafficked for a period of time, and then when I got out of that, uh, went to substances uh, to be able to mask some of the, the feelings and thoughts that I had. Um, which then got me involved in, in, involved in the adult criminal justice system. Um, a lot of times when I would come in and out, it was misdemeanors. Um, I would come in, I would be put in a holding cell, the next day I would be in front of a judge, and any encounter that I had with an attorney would be right before I went to court. And they would come in, they would tell me you know, what my charges were, that if I pled guilty, I could get out in a couple of days or weeks or even a month, and then, um, and then that would be it. And so because I wasn't familiar with how to navigate that system or what the requirements were, I would just plead guilty uh, so that I knew I had a time that I could get out. Um, and then within weeks, months, I would be back through that same system again. Because I didn't have support in the community. I didn't know at the time that I was struggling with a mental health disorder. Um, I was, you know, when I thought about mental health, I thought about what I had seen on TV and what Hollywood portrayed as somebody that was mentally ill. And see, I didn't see that. When you looked at me, you didn't think that there was anything wrong because I could, I could have a conversation with you. Um, I looked like uh, anybody else. But inside was what I was trying to mask with those drugs. And so, you know, as an addict, uh, you know, I was trying to uh, just be able to numb myself. Um, during that time, I, I was involved in the criminal justice system for almost 20 years. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when a, an attorney would approach me would be, you know, because of your extensive history, I think that the only thing that we can do today is plead guilty. You know, instead of being, uh, you know, consenting to it, I was just compliant because the only thing that I knew is that I wanted to get out. And a lot of times the reason I wanted to get out was not because I had anything to go back to, because I was homeless. Um, I didn't have any natural support systems in the community. Um, it was because I was on this mission to die. I felt hopeless. I didn't feel like my life was ever going to amount to anything because that's what I had been told over and over in the court system that I was a menace to society, that uh, you know, a lot of times that I was a nuisance um, because I was coming in and out and nothing was changing. It wasn't until uh, 1999 that uh, I came in for a probation violation. 
you know, probation for me was always a setup. I didn't have transportation. I didn't have an address. And so for me to uh, make court dates or be able to report to probation uh, was something that was difficult. And so I never complied with what I was asked. Um, and I remember uh, going into court and they told me that they were going to give me some county time again. And see, at that point, I had given up. And I said I wanted to go to prison because I thought that if I went to prison, I could get out within 30 days and I could continue on that mission that I was on. Because, see, I didn't think that my life was ever going to change. I didn't feel that I had anything to live for. And so I was on, like I said, on this mission to, to just to be able to give up. So I went to prison. Uh, and the charge, the probation violation that I had went on was possession of cocaine. Um, and... When I got there, I realized that I did not want to be like some of these women that were going to be there for the rest of their lives. And I think that was the first time that I got some hope. Uh, there was an attorney that I remember that I had got one time, and he had told me that you know I had a lot more potential than what I gave myself credit for. And I think that at that time, he really made a difference in my life. So through this, this 20 years of in and out of incarceration, you know, I had three children, and I lost all three of my children to the state. Um, I didn't have any parents that were there to support me. I didn't have any family members because everybody th looked at me based on my history, my criminal history, uh, what I was doing. I was not very productive. I wasn't uh, contributing anything into the community. Um, and so basically... Um, I had, like I said, I had just given up. When I went to prison, I, I, re I realized that I was doing to my children what my mother had did to me, and I didn't want that for them. And so I decided that I needed to make some changes, but I really didn't know what I needed to do because, see, I didn't know that I, was, uh, ha I had a mental illness. I knew I had a substance abuse problem, but I didn't know how to get help. No one had ever offered any support or, or resources available to me. And so when, you know, earlier when that question was asked, um, how many of you are familiar with what the services that are provided? And a lot of you didn't raise your hands. Well, I didn't know what those resources or services were either. And I will tell you that there's a lot of individuals that are coming in out of the criminal justice system that don't know that resources are available. And so when they're released, they go right back to doing what it is that they were doing, not because that's what they want to do. It's, my, it's A lot of times it's because that's all they know or that's all they have to go back to when they get out. And then when we see them coming back in through the doors again, it's like, you know, they're just, you know, they're just um, repetitive. You know, it becomes that revolving door. And we tend to blame the individual, but not really understanding what their story is or why they continue to keep coming back uh, through that system. You know, sometimes there is a benefit when they go to jail because they may have somewhere safe to sleep that night. They may get three meals a day. But it's not something that, like what I think it was um, one of you ladies had talked about, is that you don't wake up in the morning and say, T today I want to be a criminal. I want to go out and I want to do something that's going to get me put in jail. That's not what people wake up and think. They just, you know, a lot of times it's them just out there surviving. Um, and so I think it, when you have that opportunity, when you're working with someone, is asking them, you know, not what's wrong with you, like, like you said, but what has happened to you? Why do you continue to keep coming through the, gym, the criminal justice system? You know, what is it that you feel like, what barriers are keeping you from getting the support or services that you need? Like I said, sometimes they may not even know what's going on with them internally. Um, when I got out of prison, I still didn't know what services or res resources were available but I knew that I didn't want to go back to the same environment that I had been living in. And so the one thing that I did work on was getting my kids back. And through that process, I knew that they would probably need some counseling because, you know, everything that they had been through uh, was something, you know, but I didn't need those things because I was no longer living in that environment. But I learned early on that I needed some support and services myself. And it was going in and just talking to someone and then them referring me to community mental health services and calling Common Ground uh, and using their access center uh, and being able to talk about what, what I had been through, sharing some of my history, and then telling me that there was help, that they could help me. 
And I will tell you, even when I was off substances, I still had a lot of the same thoughts and behaviors, and I was still committing some of those, um, those crimes that I was doing because I was still trying to survive. You know, as an adult, 38 years old, you would think that that person would know how to take care of themselves. And at 38, I did not know how to do those basic things that most adults do. I had never learned how to cook. I had never learned how to budget. I had never had my own place. Um, and so these were things that were important that I needed to learn. And I learned that coming in and getting support through uh, the services that they provided. And I was connected to an organization that provided mental health services. Even though at the time I still didn't realize that's what I needed. But I will tell you, uh, by receiving those services, just going into uh, a DBT program, uh, getting one-on-one uh, -on -one talk therapy, ha having a psychiatrist to prescribe medications, uh, really made a difference in, in my life. You know, once I started receiving those services, I never had, you know, and it's, it's not that I, uh, you know, it was, a, you know, like, it didn't happen overnight. There was no easy button. You know, I thought because when I came in for services that they would be able to fix me because I was broken. And I realized early on through person-centered planning, and, and I know that you ladies talked about that too, was really important because when they asked me what my goals were, I didn't know. I didn't really have any goals. All I knew was I needed help. And and so there was no easy button. I actually had to do a lot of the work myself, but I had the support and the, and the services available to me that would help me in making better choices for myself. You know, the last time I had any involvement with law enforcement or the criminal justice system was 2004. Um, and I will tell you, by being a part of, you know, getting involved in services and being able to go to, to a, a residential program for substance use, being able to uh, work on the, a lot of the trauma that I have experienced in the past that kept me out there continuing to reoffend, only trying to support that habit uh, so that I could numb myself so I didn't have to feel those things. Um, you know, I was able to, to, to start processing some of that stuff. And I will tell, you know, like when I was, I, I learned the skills that I needed to, to be able to take care of myself through services. I also learned that I wasn't alone, that there was other people out there that could relate to what it was that I was going through. I remember, you know, sitting in jail sometimes. I never was offered any programs uh, um, while I was incarcerated. A lot of times it was just punishment. You did your time and you got out, and then they expected something different from you. And so I was never offered any of those programs that, uh, you know, that, were that are available because I didn't ask and no one else asked for me because we just didn't know, you know. And so, you know, having all these different programs available now to individuals uh, that potentially could be, that could save their life, you know, or maybe they don't have to be out there as long as I was because there is that support and services available to them from the time that they uh, come into the criminal justice system all the way into their, their release and then upon release being able to have those supports and network and, and that system available to them uh, to be able to help. I, um, you know, I was able to get my kids back uh, once I was able to get clean from substances, uh, and started working on my mental health. I, you know, and part of that person-centered planning was is that, um, you know, I, w I went in for intake, and I was given a, you know, these diagnoses. And, you know, some of those diagnoses were really helpful because it got me the services that I need. Other diagnoses, you know, I had to look at them and say, you know what, that was me out there trying to survive uh, because I really didn't know what else to do. But I will tell you, it made a difference in my life. Um, when I went in for person-centered planning, they asked me, what is it that you want to do? And I said, you know what, I just want to be a good mother to my kids. I had never had that opportunity in the past because uh, of the lifestyle that I was living. I also wanted to have a place for my kids to live. Um, like I said, I had never had a home. I had never learned how to be responsible and pay bills. So through community mental health, they taught me that. 
Uh, I didn't know how to shop. I didn't know how to cook meals. Those are things that they also taught me. And then I went to parenting classes. And through that process, I was able to buy a home through, you know, from Habitat for Humanity. I would have never, if you would have asked me 15 years ago, what would I have been doing? I would have told you I'd either be dead or in somebody's jail. Because that's what my future held at that time. Today I can say that, you know, I'm a, a certified peer support and recovery coach. I'm able to use my lived experience to be able to help other people that are, are going through those same th things that I have went through. And I've learned to what, how to, how to, the resources that are available out there to be able to give to someone else. You know, one of the things I would say it's coming back full circle is now I'm able to work in the jail and help individuals that are coming in. And I find that a lot of them, when they're there, is, you know, I ask them, so what do you plan on doing when you get out? And they're going right back into the same environment. That, that potentially put them in, in jail in the first place. And so, you know, with these programs that are available in the court system and in the jail now, we're able to recognize what barriers may be interfering with them getting the services or the help that they need and being able to provide those services so that they can get the support and services they need. But it takes people like you to be able to refer those services um, to judges um, and even um, pre-sentence investigations because a lot of times they're looking at people's histories and they're not looking at what's really what's the person themselves. They're looking at you know their their records. They're looking at past past you know past crimes. They're not looking at the person and, and what's going on in their life that they continue to keep on making uh, these same choices. So I know my time is about up. So I just want to say thank you uh, for being here and being able to, you know, and getting this information because it's important, you know, and if you can just help one person, you know, um, you, you've made a difference in someone's life. So thank you. So Deborah just gave you is an outline for your sentencing memos. Here's how my client lived, and now because of the services that they're going to be engaging in, here's how their life is going to look different. And now here's how your sentence should read, Judge, based upon now there's going to be these changes and a new path that's never been had before. So thank you for that, Deborah. You just gave us an outline. Thank you. Um, our next speaker who's going to give us some practical um, hands-on advice is Kathy Yunker, who's worked in the public health system uh, for over 40 years. She currently serves as Director of Access and Acute Care here at the network. She and her team are responsible for many of the collaborations with community partners in Oakland County, including law enforcement, Oakland County Jail, specialty courts, juvenile justice, and local hospitals and crisis center. So all of the specialty courts that uh, Oakland County is enjoying now for persons, um, we can thank the network and Kathy and her team for helping put some of these in place. She is also uh, working on many statewide initiatives, including the Justice Diversion Committee and the Michigan Crisis Intervention Legislative Workshop. So thank you, Kathy. Still morning, so I'm going to say good morning to everyone. Um, I did want to, first of all, um, acknowledge that the reason that we are so passionate about what we do are stories um, like the one we just heard. Much of the systems work we do can seem um, kind of dry and administrative, um, but it's when it touches the individual and you see life change, uh, that it keeps that motivation really, really high. Get past my picture here. So speaking of dry, <laughs> what I want to take us through today is the model that is being um, promoted nationally. It is known as the sequential intercept model. Uh, the reason that this has uh, really taken root um, is that it was born out of a national crisis of looking at the number of individuals with mental health needs who were ending up in jails. 
Uh, as a result, SAMHSA, um, along with uh, some of you know other national organizations, have come together. This is probably um, about 10 years in the making. Uh, to really establish a model where all of the different systems that come together, touching individuals moving through the justice system, can take a look at what can we do and where can we intervene and create different pathways for individuals and intercept those uh, individuals from going deeper into the justice system. So that is where this um, came from. Here at OCHN, we've used this to kind of be planful about where we are able to either co-locate services, um, where to focus our efforts in uh, making sure our information is out there, because every one of our systems is working with limited resources. Um, so we have to be able to combine those resources if we want to see uh, services for people. Um, so what I'm going to do is take each one of those intercept points and go through what we, uh, at least on the mental health system side, um, have developed or have available for the community. Um, intercept zero uh, is essentially uh, early intervention, prevention, and crisis response. So those are primarily community resources. The system that you'll see represented here is primarily our uh, crisis system as well as other community um, organizations. Uh, as mentioned previously, Common Ground is our contracted crisis provider. Um, they've been in the community for many decades, uh, but for um, Oakland County's um, assessment and uh, crisis response, they are our current provider. They are located at the Resource and Crisis Center at the 1200 uh, complex. And they are a crucial uh, partner, certainly in intercepting with uh, law enforcement um, and the legal system. Um, you'll find information out on the table. Uh, if you want to make sure you take that, it has all of the crisis numbers and information um, that you can share. Uh, Common Ground is our designated center for doing the assessments for inpatient admission. Um, so any individual that is uh, being petitioned for assessment can come to or be transferred to the Common Ground unit for that psychiatric assessment. Again, that decision is only based, um, it's a clinical decision clearly, um, and it is to determine whether that person meets criteria for inpatient care. Um, a petition is not required for that assessment, so we do have individuals who come voluntarily. They may walk in, family members may bring them to the center. Um, the assessment is the same. On the flip side of that, coming in with a petition does not guarantee inpatient admission either. Um, that clinical determination is made by the clinical staff and psychiatrist. Um, many times, many times, the majority of the time, we look to connect individuals to lower, more community-based interventions. Uh, people who meet inpatient criteria can often, if it is voluntary, be served in the crisis residential unit, can be involved in what's known as partial hospitalization programs that do not require that the person uh, be admitted to a secured hospital setting. So there are many options out there. Common Ground can assess and refer for all of those. 
uh, intercept one, and you'll see I kept zero and one together um, because of the um, crucial interplay between uh, the parties involved here. Uh, intercept one is primarily where uh, we have focused our pre-booking jail diversion efforts. We have been, Oakland County has been involved in that long before uh, it became a national initiative. Um, and I'll share some resource information at the end as well. Uh, essentially, it's to intervene in a way that gets an individual to mental health services prior to charges actually needing to be filed. Um, Common Ground, again, is our location for uh, law enforcement to do those drop-offs. Um, they are able to divert um, those uh, calls pick the person up if necessary, and then they're able to bring them directly to common ground. Uh, we've done a great deal of training with local law enforcement. Um, I don't know how familiar people may be with what's known as CIT, Crisis Intervention Team Training. Uh, that is a national model as well. It is 40 hours of training that law enforcement officers engage in along with our uh, clinicians, specialists, uh, people served, um, to really understand how to respond differently in the community face-to-face -face with individuals. Um, what we've seen in Oakland County is a tremendous shift in law enforcement's uh, actions um, when encountering someone with a mental illness. Um, so we, we see the situation being approached differently by those trained officers, and we see diversions. Um, we don't require, obviously, that law enforcement bring individuals to common ground. We support that option, uh, but diversions are off also possible, taking individuals to an emergency room, uh, returning individuals to supports in a home, all those are diversions away from charges, away from jail, and uh, back to supports. So we're very pleased with that. Um, we've also instituted mental health first aid training, which is an eight hour uh, training for law enforcement across the county. And to date, uh, in the past year, I think we've trained about 148 officers in mental health first aid. So this has been a, a really critical um, and uh, fruitful effort. Um, the next intercept point is at initial, de initial detention and the initial court hearings. Um, this is a critical place certainly for uh, attorneys to be able to, uh, as they're interacting with individuals, look for um, any indicators that there is a mental health um, or underlying substance use concern um, that needs to be considered and perhaps um, brought into the discussion during these hearings. Uh, we have a number of initiatives that um, we're looking at wanting to establish that will help to increase and improve the communication that's available between the courts and um, the mental health system, as well as the jail and the mental health system, not so that um, we can uh, intervene in what the legal course of action needs to be, but so that that information is available and different decisions might be able to be made. Um, we are currently working with the jail uh, in establishing some of that right now. Um, at the Oakland County Jail, and Intercept 3, um, first part here, I'm going to focus on our efforts in the jail setting. Um, the jail has established an initial screening process that is conducted uh, in, during that initial booking period. 
Um, they're using a standardized tool called the K6, if anybody wants to look at that, um, just to give that indication of is there a need here that we need to make sure we're taking into consideration early on. That will result then in a referral for uh, an additional mental health or substance use assessment um, and then appropriate services can be referred to in the jail. Uh, we have found it crucial that we continue to embed those mental health services to be available to anyone in the Oakland County Jail. Uh, that includes psychiatric services, counseling services, case management services, um, so that we are seeing that continuity of care if it's someone who was being treated prior to incarceration, but also to ensure that as people reenter the community, um, they are doing so with treatment in place. Um, we also have at the jail what's known as the JAWS program, Jail Alliance with Supports. That is a collaborative between the jail and uh, our system to offer uh, a program that if the person is able to complete uh, effectively and successfully, does lead to being able to approach the bench for a request for reduced sentencing. Um, so we have seen uh, a reduction in jail bed days for those individuals who successfully complete that program, uh, as well as a much higher success rate of engagement with treatment when they leave, and a much lower rate of reoffending and returning uh, to jail. Yes. Um, generally, it, it ends up being a referral from within the jail. Um, they will have done the assessment to determine that an individual meets the clinical criteria for needing those services. Um, but that information does go back to the judge that the individual has been found eligible for the JAWS program. Um, and then the success uh, it, of completion of that is also relayed then back to the bench. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to mention also that we have embedded a community liaison who is an OCHN employee um, who works within the jail to make sure that people who are incarcerated have immediate access to the screening for outpatient services. Um, she is there also to help plan for reentry um, and look at you know, what are the supports that are going to be needed uh, to successfully do that. Um, she is here with us today, so several of the team members are, are in the back of the room. I'll introduce them at the end here. So if you have questions specific for these liaisons, please feel free to, um, to approach them. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we do have the intersection with several courts, the adult treatment court, court which um, Christina had covered earlier. Uh, we also have the mental health court, which was established at the 45th district. Um, our liaison is here as well. Um, keeping in mind that that court is, can take cases that are not necessarily associated with 45th district. Those can be transferred to the 45th district mental health court um, as long as the person is meeting that clinical criteria and is um, able to access that program. There is new legislation, which we were very glad to see, that will allow for the development of a juvenile mental health court in Oakland County. Um, much to come on that, very early stages, but we were very encouraged uh, to see that change. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the juvenile system 
is very different uh, than the adult system. So the options that are there um, are very different. Uh, we could do a whole morning on that. Um, but we do have uh, juvenile justice liaisons also embedded at the family court for that very reason. Again, to be able to offer that uh, screening, the connection, the referral to services, and provide uh, information that can help feed and lead to some different outcomes. Um, I will mention very briefly uh, at probate, um, of course, we have the assisted outpatient treatment um, options available for individuals. Um, I do want to encourage that on the table, we do have a brochure about Kevin's Law, um, which is where our assisted outpatient treatment um, process grows out of. Um, you'll note contact information here, and we do have a liaison, Mac Holman, who is located at the probate court, um, who is the touch point for pursuing uh, Kevin's Law orders. Um, so if you have specific questions um, about that and for him, please feel free to contact him. Uh, intercept 4 and 5, reentry back into the community. Uh, this is a huge um, focus right now nationally because it is certainly important to intervene on the front end and uh, really support people preventing them from entering into the system. But as we have heard, many times people come out without the tools and without the supports that are needed to keep that cycle from repeating. Um, so we have uh, established, as I said, a, a jail liaison that is embedded at Oakland County Jail um, who is there to help make that plan with that individual to support the process of getting connected to treatment as well as other types of supports that are necessary. Uh, crucial to that um, is certainly access to medication. Um, we know that individuals who have been in Oakland County Jail for more than 30 days um, have now lost their Medicaid eligibility um, if they had that to begin with. Um, that leaves an individual coming out of incarceration having been engaged in treatment um, with no means of getting medication um, unless we ensure that we provide it. Um, so we are uh, focusing on increasing the ability to make sure that people get medication and also that they get their uh, benefits reestablished as quickly as possible so that Medicaid and other supports are in place. Um, again, on the Intercept 5, uh, we have just recently brought on um, a probation and mental health community liaison. Uh, we've identified this as an area where our system of mental health supports and probation parole, um, there's a lot of disconnect. Um, and information that uh, often is not able to be accessed or shared, or just not understanding how each of the systems works. As a result, we see many individuals with mental health needs, substance use needs, who are out on probation, who end up back largely because of technical violations um, and not being able to access and demonstrate um, their compliance with uh, probation terms. So we are launching a new initiative to improve that information sharing and understanding of systems, as well as supporting individuals um, in understanding how they um, can successfully meet the requirements. So at every point across this model, 
there are three main uh, objectives or goals, and that is to decriminalize mental illness. No one should be incarcerated simply because of the symptoms related to their mental illness. Um, we want to develop options that divert from further penetration into the system. So if someone does touch uh, law enforcement and end up in perhaps jail, how do we intervene in a way that uh, keeps them from returning? And then we want to see an increase in the engagement in treatment and supports. Uh, the outcomes that they're looking at across the, the nation, really, and these are the numbers they're starting to track in different communities, uh, is certainly to reduce the number of people with mental illness that are booked into jail. Um, you'll hear various statistics. I've heard anything from 50 to 80 percent of people uh, in jail have some form of mental illness. Um, we are seeing here in Oakland County that number, that census, has begun to decline. Uh, we think a lot of that is on the front end with law enforcement um, engaging differently, um, but we're also seeing that the sentences for individuals with mental illness um, nationally tend to be up to 14 days longer than someone who does not have a mental illness. So that other piece that we're after is shortening that length of stay, making sure we can demonstrate that um, care is in place and that people can uh, leave um, earlier, perhaps, than they have in the past. Uh, we also want to increase, certainly, the connections to services. Um, both for mental illness and, as you heard, Christina's uh, presentation, the efforts um, for people in jail with medication-assisted treatment, continuity as people are coming out. And then that final number um, that's being looked at nationally is reducing that rate of recidivism for individuals um, in need of those mental health and substance use supports. Where do you begin? Um, we, in all of our efforts, want to go back to begin as early in the process or contact as possible. So any intervention um, that can begin sooner is going to be more effective. So the initial interactions with individuals who's ever touching them, whether it's an attorney, whether it's jail staff, whether it's a crisis uh, provider, um, that early identif identification is crucial. As you're speaking with people, um, the information to explore and the history to consider um, doesn't just have to be a question that says, do you have a mental health diagnosis? Do you have a mental illness? The individual may or may not self-disclose. There's a great deal of stigma. Uh, when it comes to mental illness, certainly when it comes to substance use disorders. Um, so exploring questions about what their life has been uh, like, what kind of medications are they currently on, um, what is their health care um, provider been telling them. Certainly contact with family members helps to flesh out some history. Uh, but approaching it as an advocate um, is likely to render more information um, than necessarily uh, approaching it directly asking the individual for a diagnosis. So we did want to put in your hands uh, the contact information for uh, many of the liaisons that we do have uh, working out in the community. Um, we found that actually getting even just one individual that's embedded in another system does a tremendous uh, job of shifting how those systems work together. 
So our pre-booking jail diversion coordinator, um, Dan Holloway, has been working with law enforcement for close to 15 years. Um, he does much of the training uh, that we uh, have launched in the community, is available for law enforcement uh, for conferencing and problem solving, and he's been a huge asset in seeing some of those uh, pre-booking diversions. So contact info there. Uh, as I said, the juvenile justice system and the options that are available for juveniles, because we know they are uh, distinct and different, um, Siri Sakura is our primary juvenile justice liaison. She's embedded at the family court. Um, Ashley Sansom is a, a staff person that we've been able to bring on uh, due to a grant, and she is doing screening both at the court and then also for uh, youth that are referred to her through the truancy uh, officers. Uh, the adult treatment court um, that Christina spoke of, Megan Phillips is um, the liaison there. I do need to mention that uh, we do have uh, an additional liaison there through Common Ground, um, and uh, she is embedded there as well. The Mental Health Court 45th District liaison is Megan Hebert. She is here today if you have questions about that court. The Oakland County Jail liaison, Melissa is embedded, as I said, right in Oakland County Jail, and her contact information is there. Um, additional Oakland County resources, uh, Christina mentioned community corrections as well. We do have a liaison, Lindsay Johns, uh, who does both screening for substance use and mental health needs, as well as some short-term counseling available. Our newest addition, as I said, was to add the probation mental health liaison, um, and her name is Jody Gorenflo. She is here today as well. And if you had uh, questions regarding Kevin's Law or assisted outpatient treatment, uh, Mac Holman uh, is located at the probate court. And um, again, feel free to take one of those. Any questions? And finally, we have Heather Lewis, um, who is an attorney who's been practicing for over uh, 20 years, first as an APA in Wayne County for 15 years, and now since July 2014 working in Oakland County's Corporation Council. Um, she does petitions for mental health treatment hearings and um, includes uh, several jury trials throughout the year. Um, so she's going to tell you how to bring this together in the Oakland County circuit. Thank you. Hi, good, good morning still. So as she said, I, um, I'm certainly not an expert in mental health. Uh, I'm not a mental health professional, but for the past 20 years, I have kind of worked mental health adjacent. I started um, at, anyone remember the Sarah Fisher Center? I worked there uh, through my early years of law school as a youth supervisor where I um, had to understand the backgrounds, read the cases of all of the children that I worked with. And then I went to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office where I had a, it was eye-opening um, whether, how, how much the mental health system and mental health was so connected with the criminal justice system, whether it was the victims of crime, because we do know that those with mental illness are at a higher likelihood to be a victim of a crime, uh, witnesses of crime, or defendants that I dealt with, um, NGRIs, or uh, finding solutions that would work for someone who is mentally ill who had allegedly committed a crime. And then I came over to Oakland County uh, Corporation Council. So I moved over to civil, and for the past five years or so, I've been the attorney responsible for conducting the um, 
the hearings for the petitions for mental health treatment. Uh, I do about 600 of these a year, and we do more, my understanding is we do more than any other county, and then therefore I do more than anybody else. So I know many of you are here, um, you just do criminal law, but I do see a lot of familiar faces. Um, though the familiar faces I see are those who probably don't need anything I'm about to say because they're some of the best that I come across in court. But I'm hoping that even if you aren't um, on the list for the involuntary um, or the petitions for mental health treatment, some of what I say will help you in dealing with your clients, interacting with your clients, and understanding many of people in the criminal justice system are also going through my portion at the same time or have or will. So, let's see. I loved how um, in the opening, one of the first sentences that was said today was treating individuals with dignity and support. And if there's anything that you leave with, um, you know, in the, the 3,000 that I've seen, cases I've seen, I have seen such a greater level of success in the cases where the attorneys have treated their clients with dignity and support. Um, and when handling the cases with those who do have a mental illness, in my experience and what I've seen that has worked for others is starting off with setting aside time. You're going to need to have more time likely than you would in your other cases. Uh, and beginning your contact with listening. You're dealing with individuals who have, in my opinion, more often experience being talked at, being talked to, being told what to do. These are individuals who often don't feel heard more than the general public. And taking that time to start with listening instead of jumping in with, this is what you need to do, this is what's happening. Just setting aside that for a little bit will make the entire process go better. The odds are the entire interaction will go faster if you start by letting them talk. So you start with listening, prepare to be exceedingly patient. You are likely dealing with someone who is not at this time at their baseline. Someone who is, you know, in the, the wording of the statute has a significant disorder of thought or mood. And at the time you're dealing with them, that you're interacting with them, they're struggling with this right now. So you as the professional, you as their advocate, need to be prepared walking into the situation to be patient. Um, and then for the mental health cases, um, I'm going to list the specific things that information you must provide. But you can also think about it in the criminal cases. Um, make sure, I, I've seen it time after time, where because the person is more difficult to interact with at the time you're seeing them, that the attorneys aren't always providing them with the information that you're required to do. So in the mental health situation, in the petitions for uh, treatment, they need to understand they have their rights. Um, well, they need to know what's the allegations against them, whether it's showing them the information in a criminal matter, showing them the warrant, or the petition in the clinical certs. Bringing a copy that they can hold on to makes a difference. They don't feel, often the patients, you know, they, part of their psychosis might be paranoia. Give them the documents. The documents give them ownership. It gives them power. It makes your life easier, and it makes them feel like they're a part of the process. It's not something happening to them. Explain they have a right to appear. In my matters, they also have a right to waive their appearance. They have a right to a jury trial. So often, attorneys skip over this right because they don't want to do a jury trial. 
We've done jury trials. Mr. Barnes, they're not that hard. They're a morning, if that. They're easy. It's not the end of the world if one of the patients wants to do a jury trial. Just do it. I call one witness. I prepared the jury instructions. You call or don't call your client. It's easy. Um, they have a right to independent evaluation. Let them know that. Let them know also the consequences. If there's a jury trial or independent evaluation, the odds are they're going to stay in the hospital while that happens. An independent evaluation is going to take about two weeks. Jury trial could be two to four weeks. It used to be when I started that usually the patients that asked for jury trials or independents were discharged uh, before those happened. So people who had long had been aware, been a part of the system for a long time, knew this. They'd ask for the trial. They'd get out, and it was a revolving door. Hospitals are keeping the patients much more. So let them know that the odds are they will stay there until their trial. Let them know the lean consequences. Now, if a person, if this is their first time having a petition for uh, treatment, they are not in the lean system yet. If they go forward with their hearing and an order is entered, they will be in the lien system. And the consequences are, are pretty severe. Currently, there is not a mechanism to remove a person from lien once they're in. Hopefully, that's a change that will occur, but it does not exist at this time. And I've had people, um, you know, it makes travel difficult. Uh, even people who are not allowed to fly because they were in the lien system. They weren't allowed to go over to Canada. So if your client, if this is their first time, they should know this. And when they have an opportunity for a deferral hearing, it would probably be in their best interest to go that route. If they're already in the lien system, it, it's moot. Um, but I find that that's, that's something a lot of attorneys completely miss. Uh, explaining the process in court. Um, anyone here have to ever been an actual um, litigant or testify in a hearing themselves? Anyone? Okay. So when I was a prosecutor, um, I was in special operations, and I did thousands of jury trials, and I was never nervous. I've had to testify multiple times, and I was terrified. Um, it's an entirely different process, and to keep in mind um, that with your clients, this is scary. This is intimidating. This is embarrassing sometimes. Um, their personal business is being put out in court in front of strangers. And what you can do to prepare them for the process, everything you can do is to their benefit and to yours. Um, it builds trust, and it builds uh, confidence in the fact that you're advocating for them, and it will make them more cooperative in the process when it's actually happening. So also explain and keep in mind that often, you know, when we go to court, there isn't a lot of time before the hearing to talk to your client. There isn't a lot of time after the hearing to talk to your client. So explaining to them in, a, in the prior meeting this is what's going to happen in court. You're going to sit here. You're going to sit next to me. This prosecutor is going to present questions. Then I can ask questions. And after, the judge is either going to deny it or there'll be an order. And then explain what happens after the order. I can't tell you how often a, a, a respondent sits there and is like, uh, what happens now? And the court's already calling the next case. And the attorney's on that case, so they don't even get to talk to the person. Now that person feels railroaded, they feel devalued, they feel lost, and that, that's not being an advocate. So if you can prepare them even beforehand, that does help the situation. Um, also, keep in mind that the person you're dealing with, you're interacting with, your client, is someone who is allegedly has a mental illness someone who has a significant disorder of thought or mood, and someone who is not at their baseline, is not their best selves at this time. Keeping that in mind when you're having interactions and providing information um, can put things in perspective. You're likely going to be treated badly by some of the clients with mental illness. 
you will likely be called names, especially in the um, where I am. You can't take this personally. It's, um, it's not a judgment on you. It's part of where they are at this time. It's not something to take personally. It's not something to engage in. Um, there are times when certainly it's an issue where you know there are legitimate threats, and then you bring that to court's attention. And every judge um, in our mental health probate will honor a request for you to be removed if there is a situation like that. But for the most part, just not taking it personally, being professional, moving on, gets you to where you need to be. Um, there's also times when due to maybe a serious psychosis or something like dementia that you, it's just not happening. The conversation's not happening. Do your best to provide the information, but sometimes, you know, what can you do when a person is, um, like, and I'm missing the word, but, you know, completely not connecting with you in any way. Um, let's see. And what I've noticed, so I, I've seen the attorneys who come into court and clearly haven't connected with their client prior to coming to court and um, aren't connecting with their client in court. They, they don't introduce themselves. Again, attorneys that don't even recognize which people in the jury box are brought in are their clients. Uh, that client immediately feels insulted, not valued, feels like the conspiracy, like you're part of it. Just take a moment to acknowledge them. And I find that the attorneys that do the right things, the hearing goes beautifully. The judge may rule against them, but when they've hurt, you know, felt respected, they leave that room feeling as an individual, feeling um, more open to treatment. If they're not treated well by their own attorney, they leave feeling railroaded, this is all against them, and they're less likely to cooperate with treatment. Um, and in court, and I, I kind of touched this, See what I'm trying to make sure this applies to everybody, even though. Oh, this mostly just applies, I think, to the um, hearings that I do. But things that I've noticed the respondents respond favorably to is, you know, after introducing yourself to them, after I, you know, I call the witness, I call a doctor you question the doctor, then leaning over and saying, do you have any questions for the doctor? That makes a big difference. Um, when it's time to do a closing argument, if the client is there, me, the judges, no one is going to hold it against you if you do a closing argument. Most attorneys waive. The odds are the evidence I've presented is overwhelming. The odds are the court is going to enter the order. It doesn't mean you can't stand up and say a couple sentences so that the uh, respondent feels like you cared um, at the very least. And even if it's, you know, you don't want to necessarily argue things that don't exist, but simply saying something to the effect is, you know, my client feels hospitalization is not the best place. My client feels she's perfectly capable of taking care of herself. You can say those things. The judge isn't going to be mad. I'm not going to be mad. You're not, you know, being unethical. You're not lying to the court. But the advocate or the respondent feels like they have an advocate. Um, in, in testifying, they have a right to testify. And I'm saddened by how often a respondent, you know, they, they get out of bed, they get up early, they ride the, the van to court, they wait in this jury box as like their defendants, even though they're not. They sit there, and then the attorney doesn't even ask them if they want to testify. The attorney's like, no witnesses. And the person's like, well, why was I here? I have so much to say. Call them. 
the judges never get mad if you call the witness. If they want to talk, let them talk. The odds of it changing the outcome in any way is it, it's slim to none. We are, I've already presented an expert. I presented medical evidence. But give them their day in court. Let them say what they want. The ones that um, feel like they were heard in most of the judges at Oakland County will listen patiently, respectfully, acknowledge the respondent, and then make a ruling. And every time the respondent walks out, even though the same order was entered, feeling better. And um, it doesn't change the outcome necessarily. It really changes the outcome of the actual you know, decision that the court makes. But it changes the perception of the respondent, which, you know, this is different than criminal law, um, but I, in my opinion, that's important. Um, so, in, in, I've just found overwhelming those who feel like participants in these hearings have better results. Same orders entered. Their reaction to the order is entirely different. Um, then raise your hand if um, you do ever do these hearings. I'm talking about the involuntary or the mental health treatment. Okay. So then I will hit a few things. These are like my corporation counsel's things that I wish everybody knew. Um, have a basic understanding of mental illness. Uh, like a thing that catches people up is psychosis NOS, psychosis not otherwise specified. This just means there are signs of a mental illness. There's, there's a psychosis. They meet the criteria, but we don't know exactly what the diagnosis is. And that links into my next one. Some mental illnesses, in my understanding, can't be diagnosed with your first contact. For example, uh, schizophrenia. First time a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old young man comes in and he's, you know, has all these symptoms, they're not going to initially say that's um, schizophrenia because my understanding is that it requires a longer time frame to have that diagnosis. So the initial diagnosis is going to be psychosis not otherwise specified. Um, physical causes. There are physical things that can cause psychosis. There are physical things that can cause someone to meet the criteria of um, having a mental illness. That doesn't mean that they don't actually have a mental illness. For example, um, there could be a traumatic brain injury. There could be, um, it can be drug induced. It could be, um, we see it with the elderly, the urinary tract infections. Now, the psychosis may go away. It may not be a chronic mental illness, but at this time, they still uh, meet the criteria for the, uh, the petitions, and people, that people don't get that all of the time. Um, dementia alone is not enough, according to the Mental Health Code, for uh, this hearing, but dementia, dementia plus, like a psychosis, is. Um, let's see. The basic petitions. Oh, understand the mental health code and the court rules for mental health hearings. You can just get embarrassed if you don't understand that. Um, for example, I'm not required to call the petitioner. I almost never, ever call the petitioner. I don't even have them come. Uh, the court can order Kevin's Law on a regular uh, hospitalization order. Uh, hearsay is admissible by the expert if it's being used, um, the information is being used for the diagnosis. So those are some things that you know, we may get objections to that really aren't uh, objections. Another thing is um, the mental health code is really strange about my position. So first of all, it says prosecutor. I'm not a prosecutor anymore. Uh, the Oakland County um, Board of Commissioners did a resolution in like the 70s that trans transferred that responsibility to corporation counsel. Another thing is the only time the mental health code mentions prosecutor, it says the prosecutor shall participate in the hearing. Yeah. So unlike in criminal law where, you know, when I was a prosecutor, I, I, I did the warrant and I, I had uh, discretion and I represented the people, I participate. 
and I don't know exactly where this came from or why, but this is an in re case, right? There aren't actual two parties on this, and they needed somebody to ask the questions. And the legislator went, legislators went, well, who's going to ask the questions? And they're like, oh, I know who we have that works for free, the prosecutors. Let's just put them down. That's the only thing I can come up with. I don't, I don't have clients. I don't actually represent the petitioner. I'm just there to ask the questions. Um, so it's a far less adversarial situation than most people think that it is. Um, documents and who's who. The Oakland County website, the probate court, has great resources. If you just got on you know, Oakland County, if you Googled Oakland County probate mental health, you'll see all the forms and documents that you need. Some practical um, matters are Knowing that, so we have the four judges, um, the probate judges that handle the mental health hearings. The files don't get to them till the morning of the hearing. The main point of contact you should be having is with the um, probate mental health clerk. That's the person to contact, um, you know, you get your information from if you need documents. If your client can't hear well, call ahead and get a hearing assisted device. Uh, if they need an interpreter, get the interpreter. Those are not things the court or me are going to know are needed. That, that's something that you're gonna have to work out with uh, the probate clerk's office. Uh, the four judges have different start times. Just make sure you know which ones. And then the, the doctors that we have, we have four doctors that regularly testify. They are psychologists, not psychiatrists. So their specialty cannot, uh, they don't, discuss medications generally. And with the exception of Dr. Tarion, they are not the treating doctors. There's a lot of good reasons we don't have to get into of why we do it that way. Um, independent evaluation, the list is online. If your client wants an independent evaluation, you set that up. Um, if you're getting a jury trial, you might as well also ask for that independent evaluation at that time. Um, like I said, the jury trials are very simple, very short, um, not painful at all. Um, and I think for the most part, oh, another thing that gives people some pause is that Oakland County handles many, many other cases for other counties. And what's been told to me is, so say somebody up north um, needs mental health hospitalization. And the hospital where they or the you know where they live is not equipped to provide those services. The patients then transported down to Oakland County because we have a number of facilities that can accommodate them. Then the court clerk from that county transfers the case to Oakland County. So there can always you know often there are the clients and the attorneys are like there's no jurisdiction. Well. There is, and there's been a transfer order, and it's totally okay. Just something to be aware of. Why does this person from Kalkaska here? That's why. Um, and well, a couple other little things just, I think, are helpful to know. The file number, like say the file number is a 19 dash or 2019 dash something, doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean it's a new case. Um, people get caught up on that. The old case could have been so big, they started a new case and gave it a new number. So don't assume that this is their first contact with the mental health system because they have a, a recent case number. Um, they have, you can ask for the court to send them to a different hospital. If that's the sticking point with your respondent, your client, you can ask it. The judge can't force a hospital, you can ask it. However, for like Kevin's Law, for outpatient services, um, you can ask for a different agency and the court will um, do that unless they've gone through all of the agencies. Sometimes we see that they've done all of them, they hate them all, but that's not gonna work. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you so much for letting me ramble off my quick notes. Do I have any questions for anyone or comments? <laughs>